Welcome everyone to the first full day of Mises University. Uh, I want to thank uh, Guido Hulsman for his uh, fine lecture last night. Um, he stole much of what I was going to say today, but we'll, we'll, we'll skip over that. But I, uh, seriously, I do want to mention that uh, both his book on Mises, The Dark Night of Liberalism, and um, <laughs> The Last Night, The Last Night of Liberalism, I like ba I like Batman. What can I say? <laughs> if you look on the wall in the institute, by the way, there is um, a comic book um, with a Batman comic book issue uh, with von Mises mentioned in it. Uh, so maybe that was the reason for my why I misspoke. Um, the uh, the other book um, is Money, Bank Credit, and Economic Cycles by Jesus Huerta de Soto. Uh, which is on the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And I just want to emphasize that those are, are two of the most important works uh, in Austrian economics that have been published in the last 10 to 12 years since Murray Rothbard's two-volume history of, of economic thought appeared. Um, they're uh, major treatises and major contributions to Austrian economics, so I did want to, I did want to mention that. And as Mark um, mentioned, we're going to be talking about the marginalist revolution, which is one of the most important um, Episodes not only in, in, in economic thought, economic history, or economic thought, but also in intellectual history. Okay, um, the Marxist Revolution was, or can be defined as, um, the period in which, a very short period, three independent thinkers discovered the same principle. This is the principle of marginal utility, which I'll explain in this lecture. They were working independently um, in different countries. Karl Menger was in Austria, William Stanley Jevons was in Great Britain, and Leon Walras was in um, Switzerland. And uh, so within three years of each other, they came up with this um, extremely important principle in economics, which has become the foundation of a realistic price theory. Just to give you an idea of the, the, person, uh, the personages, what they looked like, I have pictures. These are pictures of Valras on the left and um, William Stanley Jevons on the right. Um, their development of the principle, as we'll see, was based heavily on mathematics, okay, which is really irrelevant to hum human action and to an explanation of, of the real market economy. Nonetheless, they were brilliant men. The brilliant founder of the Austrian school, it was Karl Menger. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the delusions of grandeur, I tell you. It was Karl Menger of the Austrian school. There's a slight resemblance. Um, and uh, he was 31 when he, dis when he wrote his, his, his principles, which was the book that was the founding work of Austrian economics. So let me say a few words about Menger and so on, about the Marxist Revolution, and, um, and then, then we'll show how it, in fact, is still relevant today, and in fact, at the very base of Austrian economics. Um, the, the, the Jevons and Valras, who discovered the principle, and they, they use different terms. For example, um, Jevons used the word final utility, and Valras used the, the French word rarité, which is sort of rarity. Um, and, and, and Menger, by the way, did not actually name his principal. It was one of his students, Friedrich von Wieser, that named the principal marginal utility, which is Grenznutzen in um, German. Forgive my German. Um, so there wasn't really a name given by Menger. But Jevons and Valras conceived marginal utility as a sort of a quantity, a quantity of satisfaction um, that you got from consuming additional units of a good. Uh, and this quantity of satisfaction was subject to mathematical operations, and, and it could be compared between people. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, Menger completely avoided any um, implication that utility or satisfaction was something that could be measured. Okay. Uh, for Menger, the um, margin utility was really the outcome of an individual's actors' judgment about the importance of concrete goods and satisfying their wants, okay? So, this glass of water 
doesn't give me five units of utility because that's meaningless. I mean, um, so sometimes in your in your textbook you'll see uh, a reference to well, utils is a unit of utility. But you know, then the question becomes, what what the hell is a util? Okay, they can't they never explain that. Okay, well, utils don't exist. What exists is my hunger, my recognition that this can satisfy the hunger, and that and this concrete good here. Okay, it's not all the water in the world. I'm not valuing all the water in the world. We'll get to that because the classical economists made that mistake, but we're valuing um, a particular glass of water at a particular time given a, 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 a specific structure of needs that I have. So right now, the most important thing to me is, is to take a drink of this water. Okay, that was about three utils. Um, okay. All right, but he discovered much more than this, this principle of margin utility. Okay, he really created an, an entire theory of price and system of economics that was based on subjective value and individual choice, okay? And in doing so, he did found the Aust what has been come to be called the Austrian School of Economics. Actually, the name was given to it by its enemies, the German Historical School, okay? And you'll find in um, the history of, of, of ideas that many times, or most of the time, schools are, are named by their enemies, but, but the name stuck. Um, the, Aust the term Austrian was a pejorative term, it's a negative term because Austria was seen as an intellectual backwater to Germany. That, that, you know, the German universities were, 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 were the, the, the height of, of, of intellectual achievement according to the Germans themselves. And Austria was just sort of off there in, in the background and not very important. So they sneeringly called Menger and his followers the Austrian school. Well, they proudly accepted the label. Okay. And the German historical school is today forgotten. And the Austrian school is, is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, so, so Menger was a creative genius. I mean, he was, he was an Einstein in effect. Um, remember, human beings cannot create anything or destroy anything, okay, um, physically. However, we can create one thing, and that, that is ideas. So ideas are something new under the sun. Everything else is transformation of matter into energy and energy into matter. So, so new ideas are a new creation, and Menger, Menger created this system of economics, okay? And he was recognized by the greatest economists and historians of thought as being uh, uh, a creator, a creative genius. So let me just read to you three quotes very quickly. Um, one is by Joseph Schumpeter, who was an Austrian by birth, but was more of a mathematical economist who followed Walras, whose picture I had put up. But he knew Menger, and he and and, and he was part. And when he was uh, being educated, he he was in Vienna, and he was learning from the Austrian economists. And he wrote, "Menger is nobody's pupil, and what he created stands." Menger's theory of value, price, and distribution is the best we have up to now. Now he wrote that in 1921. It was in Menger's obituary. Um, Menger had come out with this theory in in 1871. So still, he was it was thought to have to have been the, the, a, a great achievement. Ludwig von Mises who was a student of Menger's student, von Bavark, wrote, what is known as the Austrian School of Economics started in 1871 when Karl Menger published a slender volume under the title in English, Principles of Economics. Until the end of the 70s, as the 1870s, there was no Austrian school. There was only Karl Menger. Okay. And finally, let me raise this for people in the back. F.A. Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize and was a student of von Mises, not a direct student in the classroom, but a follower of von Mises, wrote, the Austrian school's fundamental ideas belong fully and wholly to Karl Menger. What is common to the members of the Austrian school, what constitutes their peculiarity, and provided the foundation for the later contributions, is their acceptance of the teaching of Karl Menger. So in some sense, we are all Mengerians. We are all followers of Karl Menger. Okay, so before we can really um, get a feel for what Menger's achievement was, we have to look at the state of economics on the eve of Menger's publication of his great work, Principles of Economics. And what we had there was the classical um, economic system, which was the most developed system of economics at the time. It was uh, uh, developed by British economists. Um, Guido mentioned one last night, Adam Smith, being the most famous. Uh, uh, and and uh, that's not to deny that, that Menger had many other influences besides the classical school, that there were many um, French, Italian, and, con and even German economists that had some ideas that were similar to Menger's. That is, they believed that, in some sense, 
all goods are valued subjectively, but they, they, weren't un, they were unable to create a full system of economics because they didn't have the principle of margin utility. But the classical economists had the most complete system of economics at the time, and some of it was very good, and some of it was very bad. Okay, um, it was, it was mistake ridden, and, and Menger did not set out to overthrow the classical school, but what he did want to do was, was to correct their mistakes and integrate the system of, of, of classical economics into a system in which we start from the human, be uh, human beings, as we'll see. So what did the classical school um, say? Okay, first of all, who are they? I'll just quickly give you the names, and then I'll give you some of their characteristic doctrines very quickly. Um, David Hume may have been the first classical economist. He wrote a, many essays. He, he was a philosopher first and then an economist second. But he was, he was his essays were very good, his essays in economics. They influenced Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations and is incorrectly called the father of economics. Um, and then David Ricardo was a follower of Smith uh, and wrote um, uh, the most integrated system of classical economics in a very short book in 1811. Okay, so these were the, the men involved. And what did the classical school say? First of all, very importantly, they observed that the prices that were being paid in the real world, the actual prices that were being paid, were not random, they were not accidental, they were not set by greedy businessmen, okay? They were set by the whole market situation of supply and demand, at least in the short run. So prices were determinant. The classical school noticed that prices always tended to, but never necessarily reached the cost of production. Now, they had a, a, an incorrect explanation for why this was so, but they recognized this regularity in prices and they tried to explain it. Why prices should always tend towards the so-called cost of production. Secondly, they pointed out that, look, prices regulated production and the allocation of resources. When prices changed, Capitalists and entrepreneurs changed the things that they produced. Laborers left some jobs and went to other jobs when, when wages changed. And they did so in a fashion that was systematic. Okay, so they realized that prices regulated production, again, in the short run. Um, so if a, if a company was losing money, they noticed that, in fact, and they explained why, you would have workers leaving that industry because their wages were being cut or they were being laid off. Um, capitalists were taking their money out of that inter industry and um, investing it in other things. They were taking their money, let's say, today a classical economist would say, well, they're taking their money out of the production of SUVs, large trucks, and so on, and they're shifting into um, the production of hybrid cars. Okay, And, and so that the wages of laborers that are making the, 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 the larger um, uh, sorts of vehicles are coming down, on the one hand, because there's less demand for their labor, and, w and wages of those making hybrid cars or, or doing research uh, and engineering for hybrid cars go are going up. There was a systematic pattern there, okay? Um, and let me just show you that pattern. This is basically what the classical school came up with. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm really shortening what they said. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a very brief overview here. What the classical school said was the following. Look, if demand for anything goes up, okay, Let's say back in the, um, I think it was probably the 1980s, when people became much more health conscious and much more weight conscious, um, and you had um, places like McDonald's and so on serving only hamburgers. What quickly changed? Well, the price of beef began to drop. Demand and price for beef began to drop. And the demand for salad, for chicken, and for other light alternatives went up. And what happened was, as, as the demand went up, the price of these things went up, okay, above their average cost. So now you, you, you could earn a profit. The classical school saw that. The profit was greater than the normal profit. Instead of just earning 5% or 10% um, on, on producing um, hamburgers and so on, now you could earn 15 or 20% return on producing chicken, on producing, uh, let's say, yog, frozen yogurt instead of ice cream and so on. How did they respond to this? The classical school was correct. They said, in fact, what happened was you would have an increase in supply. Okay. And what do we see? We saw we see salad bars and salads being offered at McDonald's and chicken sandwiches at all fast food restaurants and so on. The whole industry went through a transformation as a result of prices changing. And prices changed because the demand for the various goods changed. And they said, as this happened, however, 
more and more companies or entrepreneurs and, and capitalists would emulate those that were earning the high profits by offering salad bars and, and so on. And as the supply of the lighter alternatives went up, what happened? Well, price went down towards its natural or long run price. And the profits in the industry tended to disappear so that the, cap, the investors were only earning a normal rate of return, okay, 5 or 6%. Same, same thing very quickly um, happened in the um, auto industry in the 1980s, uh, late in the 80s into the 90s when SUVs and so on came into fashion. Demand went up. Price of these things shot up. And more and more companies offered SUVs until they, they became... Um, the supply increased to the point where the prices began to begin to come down and the rate of return tend to be even. On the other hand, the reverse occurs. If the demand for something drops as large automobiles now because of the high price of gasoline, um, you get the price falling below average cost, which means a loss. Okay, and, and certainly GM knows that. Okay, having lost billions and billions of dollars on, on, on large cars. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and so profit goes below normal. People get out of that industry or, or, or reduce the amount of the product that they're producing, supply drops, and as supply drops, prices reverse. There's less supply, so prices begin to go up again of these goods until they reach a point where there's a normal profit being returned. And this was a, this was a quite an achievement for the classical school to come up with this, okay, this analysis, okay. Um, so it was a theory of of calculable action. What drove the economy was calculating what goods, what investments will give me a profit, what will cause me loss. I avoid the losing investments, and I try to find those investments that will maximize my profit return. And another thing, uh, for the classical economists, the law of supply and demand was abstract and universal. It applied in all periods of time where there was a market economy. And um, it was applicable to all places where there was a market economy. Now, Menger agreed with this part of the classical doctrine. But there were some problems with the classical doctrine, okay? And uh, we'll, uh, let, let me just mention them quickly, and then we'll go on to Menger. Um, first of all, they attempted to explain values and prices in terms of broad and abstract classes of goods. Uh, they talked about bread and diamonds and water and iron and cotton and beef. They didn't talk about units of beef, pounds of beef, or gallons of water, or carrots of diamonds. So they got themselves into... a uh, they got themselves into a little problem. And that problem, which we'll come back to, was the paradox of value. They could not explain why the heck bread, which sustains life, right, has a much, and has therefore a higher use value than diamonds. Diamonds are only used for ornamentation or for conspicuous um, uh, displays of, of, of wealth, for ostentation and so on. So diamonds aren't as important to, the, to, to, to human beings, diamonds as a class, as is something like bread, then why is it that the exchange value of diamonds, the price of diamonds, let's say the price of a pound of diamonds, is so much higher than the price of a pound of bread? They could not explain that. Okay. So did they, what did they do? They didn't resolve the paradox. Okay. Remember, they thought in terms of the class of goods. They said, well, you know, we can't explain exactly why Bread is more useful but has a much lower price. But what we can explain is why bread has a lower price than diamonds. We're going to forget about the use value and we're just going to focus on the price or the exchange value. So they forgot about human action and they said the reason why diamonds are more expensive is because it costs more to produce a diamond or a pound of diamonds than it costs to produce a pound of bread. And they were satisfied with that explanation. But they didn't address, let alone resolve, the deeper issue of why, according to them, all, if all the bread in the world was gone, people would, would, would suffer much more than if all the diamonds were gone. Okay? They didn't resolve why diamonds had a higher price yet a lower use value than bread. Okay, so that was, that was a problem. All right. They also had another problem, and that was that they left out the consumer. Okay? Once you focus on the businessman and you focus on, on supply and demand, and you get rid of use value, you've gotten rid of the consumer. So who was the central actor in the classical economy? It was the businessman. They focused on, on the business decision maker. The person who calculated profits and losses, which is fine as far as it goes. But they didn't explain the basis of those profits and losses 
in the subjective values of the consumers. Okay, and that was a key shortcoming, as, as we'll see, that Mises saw in the uh, that Menger saw in the classical system. And so, so, so they came up with a, with a cost of production theory of value. Since they couldn't explain subjective values, since they had gotten rid of use value, they came up with a, with, with, with an objective theory of, of value, which was either that the cost of production determined the value of a good, or in the more extreme case of David Ricardo, the number of labor hours that were um, um, uh, embodied in a good determined the value. So if you had five times the amount of labor hours, um, or if it took five times the amount of labor to produce, uh, let's say, a, a high-definition LCD screen television, well, then its price would be five times the price of a regular older generation television. So you would have the LCD, let's say, costing $1,000 and the um, old generation television costing $200, because it was five times the amount of labor in the in the um, in, in the high definition television. Okay, this was clearly unsatisfactory. Why? Well, how do you explain the fact that um, last year on eBay, um, the lyrics to "I Am the Walrus," handwritten lyrics by John Lennon on the back of an envelope, sold for forty thousand dollars? Did it cost them that much labor to, to to produce these lyrics? Or how do you explain that um, uh, collectors have paid uh, one of the most famous baseball players in, in history is, is Honus Wagner, who um, played at the turn of the century. There's only five mint condition baseball, 1910 baseball cards of him or something. One of them sold about five or six years ago for $600,000. Okay. Well, did it cost $600,000 to produce that, that card? Classical economists couldn't explain any of this. Okay. So what they did, and, and in their day, they were, they couldn't explain Paintings from, from, you know, old masters paintings by Dutch painters and so on. You know, why, why were they so expensive? Why were collectible coins so expensive? Okay. Um, well, they said there's two different classes of goods. One goods are, one's class is reproducible goods, diamonds, bread, beef. And those goods are, their values determined, their price of values determined by the cost of production. And the other are sort of what they call monopoly goods or scarcity goods like paintings and so on, that, that couldn't be reproduced, and their price was determined by supply and demand. So they split their value theory, and this is completely unsatisfactory. They treated objects in the real world differently in terms of their value. Okay, Menger saw this too. Now, what are some of the uh, uh, incorrect implications of this? Um, first of all, is that value is inherent in, in, in goods. That value is somehow embodied in the good. Okay, so if, th if this... This clock here, which you can't see, um, costs uh, $20 to produce, okay, years ago. Let's say it cost $20 to produce, let's say last year. That $20 sticks to it almost like an invisible pr price tag. It costs $20 to produce, therefore it's valued at $20. Even if everybody in this room thinks that that is ugly and wouldn't pay more than a dime for that clock, I wouldn't pay more than a nickel for it, but... It's still worth twenty dollars in the classical scheme. It's a reproducible item to be reproduced. Okay, that's that's clearly unsatisfactory. In some sense, the classical economists believe that value was infused into a good by the the worker who was sweating over it. So the more sweat that you you you, you spent on producing a good, the more sweat was in the good, the higher its value. Okay. Now, if that all of that was true, oh, one last thing. Um, they also said, therefore, when two goods exchanged, that indicated that they were equal in value. So if I exchanged this clock, which is $20, for $20 from you, then the $20 was equal in value to, to the clock. Okay? And the classical economists usually talked about gold, because that was the, 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 the monetary standard. So they said the, the same amount of labor in, or cost of production of the $20 in gold was the uh, same amount of labor was in the gold as there was in, in the clock. Okay, that's why they exchanged. And we'll see, that that's, that's, that's completely wrong. Now, that sort of theory of value, where the things exchanged are equal in value, of course, does not explain why GM lost um, $6 billion in the first quarter of this year, $30 billion in 2008, and $37 billion in 2007. Why didn't they simply raise the price to reflect its cost of production, Plus the, plus the normal profit, and sell it at that price. So the classical scheme can't explain losses. 
Okay. Or take AIG, which lost um, the most money ever by by a corporation. They lost sixty-two billion dollars just in the fourth quarter of last year. Okay. Well, all of these mistakes were made because they focused on the businessman, uh, and they believed the central player in economics was the Homo economicus, meaning the economic man. Okay. And the economic man was someone who bought at a low price and sold at a high price. Okay. That was the businessman. There's no consumer mentioned in any of this. And yet, as we'll see, as Menger points out, the consumer is at the center of, of, of economics. Um, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about what Menger then, how, how he responded to all of this. Remember, he's not trying to overthrow the classical school. He's trying to take that theory of supply and demand and how prices regulate um, where resources are allocated, and he's trying to, to, to integrate it with a theory of economics that places the consumer at the center. So let me just give you a few quotes by Menger to show you what he thought of, of um, economics. Okay. This is what he thought about the nature of economics, what, what economics is and what economics should, should be doing. Okay. Um, this is in the preface to his book. He says, I have devoted special attention to the investigation of the causal connections. He was always interested in cause and effect. The causal connections between economic phenomena involving products and the corresponding agents of production, meaning the resources. Not only for the purpose of establishing a price theory based upon, and that's an important word, reality, okay, and placing all price phenomena, including interest, wages, ground rent, together under a unified point of view, but also because of the important insights we thereby gain into many other economic processes heretofore completely misunderstood. And there he's referring to the classical economists. And these are some notes that he wrote out before he wrote the book. Um, these were notes he was writing to himself as he was coming up with ideas for the book. He, um, he wrote, man himself is the beginning and the end of every economy. So it's the consumer that's the beginning. It's the consumer who's trying, to, as we'll see, to deal with his wants, who therefore activates certain processes in the economy that result in what? Goods that satisfy his wants. So he's the beginning and he's the end. Uh, he also wrote, our science is a theory of a human being's ability to deal with his wants. He's not talking about the businessman there. The businessman's not at the center. So you'll see the businessman's the intermediary. And finally, the fir very first line of his book, very first line of text says, all things are subject to the law of cause and effect. So he was trying to come up with cause and effect laws that govern the economic phenomena that he saw around him. And for a while, he was a journalist and wrote for a daily newspaper. And what caused him to write the book was that when he looked at the commodities markets and, and he looked at the stock market and so on as a journalist, he saw prices changing every minute. And they weren't changing according to the cost of production. Okay? They were changing according to how people evaluated them subjectively. So this is what inspired him to, to try to reform the uh, and reformulate the whole theory of economics that the classical school put forward. He still used supply and demand, as we'll see. Okay, um, so Menger put at the very center of economics human wants, okay? And here are other notes that he wrote to himself. Okay, what he pointed out was this. Um, look at those that trinity of causation. He says, people have ends. They, they, they want to eat. They want to send their children to college. They, they want to watch a television program. They want to make themselves a sandwich. Whatever the ends may be, they may be very sublime or they may, may be very mundane. They could be everyday wants or they could be wants. They might be uh, like Mother Teresa. They want to help the poor. All of these ends are something that motivate people or inspire people to find the means and employ the means in a way that brings about the realization of the ends. Okay, so you have causation going both ways. That is to say, from the subjective, from the ends, to the means, okay, you want to eat, so you go to the refrigerator, you find um, uh, the ham and, 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 and the cheese and, and, and the bread, you want to take some labor, you combine these factors into what you believe will be a satisfying product, and then, the, so, so, so you cause the product to come, your wants cause the product to come into existence, but then in consuming the product, the product causes the satisfaction or the realization of your ends. So, causation runs from the subjective to the objective, which is the economy that we see around us, back to the subjective. 
The consumer's at the beginning and at the end. Uh, another way he put it was man, external world, and subsistence. Man takes elements of the external world, which we call goods, as we'll see, and we use them to provide our own subsistence, which keeps us alive, which is our end. Or wants, goods, satisfaction, which is more uh, the terminology he used in his book. People have wants. They want to satisfy these wants, whatever these wants might be, okay? Um, and therefore, in order to do so, they have to have command of goods. So they produce goods. And then when they produce the goods, that's not the end of it, as it was in classical economics. They then use the goods in a way, or consume the goods in a way that, that brings them the greatest satisfaction. Okay. Now, since goods were so important, goods were the objective element in the economy, which, remember, was always created by the subjective wants. Menger said there's three or four properties of, of a good. First, something has to have a human need. Okay? You, have to, you have to be hungry. You have to want, um, want or need a means of transportation to, to, to go see a movie. Okay. Um, there has to be, secondly, such properties as render the thing capable of being brought into causal connection with the satisfaction of this need. You have ideas that, that the sandwich will, in fact, satisfy your need. It will cause the satisfaction of, of your hunger. The car will, 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 will bring about the end of, of getting you to the movies. But that's not enough. You still have to have knowledge of this causal connection. Okay, according to Menger, and here he made a mistake, as we'll see in a moment. Um, and finally, you have to have command of the thing that you believe will bring you about the um, satisfaction of the need. Okay, that is, you might want, um, you might need a sunny day so that you can enjoy a, a baseball game. You have all the means, including the ticket, transportation and so on, to get to the baseball game. But you need a sunny day. If it's rain, it'll be rained out. Um, you don't command the sun. The sun is therefore not a good. Okay, Even though when it's sunny out, it satisfies you. Since there's no way to command the sun to, to come out, or, or, or more generally, the weather. Okay, If you don't have any command of the weather, well then, that thing is not a good. It's something that you must be able to command, that you must be able to turn to your own purposes in order for it to be a good. Now, here's a mistake he made. Um, <clears throat> people have imperfections in their knowledge. Uh, some people believe that, that, that magic might, might help them bring about their ends, that, that a voodoo doll with pins stuck in it might actually you know, injure their enemy. Okay? And um, I have one of Bernanke in my bedroom. But <laughs> that's besides the point. But what me, so what, so that, is, is the voodoo doll a, a good? Even though objectively it doesn't bring about the end. No. I mean, for Menger, he would say it's not really a good, according to this, because it ha you have to have human knowledge of this causal connection. Well, Mises says that's wrong. It is a good. Okay? Because two and three can simply be summed up into you have to have a belief that there's a causal connection between um, the, 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 the thing and, and um, the satisfaction of the end. Okay, so that, that's where, where Menger was corrected by, by later on by Mises. So a good really is elements of the external world that can bring about satisfaction. So remember, all goods then are subjective. Now, Menger went, went uh, beyond this and he said, there are some things in the world that um, are so abundant, let's say air in a normal situation, that it's not an economic good. Okay, So air in a normal situation, let's say in this room, Okay, unless I keep talking and this hot air eventually forces out, out the oxygen. Um, in this room, we don't consciously strive to achieve our end to breathe. Okay, we're able to breathe because of the superabundance of air. There's more than enough air for everyone in this room. Okay. However, so therefore air is not, is not a good. Menger defined an economic good as a good for which the quantity of, uh, or, or the quantity of which is not sufficient to, to serve all human needs for the, for the thing. So for Menger, air on the moon would certainly be a good. That is, people or people will invest huge sums in producing, um, uh, let's say, suits that 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 have um, air systems in them. Or uh, deep deep sea divers will also have um, spend sums of money to, to get air uh, that that um, they can breathe below the surface of the water, right? Uh, other things might be very rare, okay, but they're not economic goods. 
Um, the malaria, uh, it's not a virus, it's a parasite. The malaria parasite is extremely rare, fortunately. And yet, it's not a good. It's not a good because it doesn't serve any human need. Okay. Now, if there's a terrorist who wants to spread malaria somewhere, then then uh, he has a human need for it, and, and it becomes a good. He's willing to, to pay money, expend resources in, 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 in collecting in collecting this parasite, and then putting it into a system that can be that can uh, generally you know, spread it out through, through, or disseminate it widely. In that case, it then becomes a good. So goods are, are what? They're subjective. They're not objective as, as the classical school somehow believed. Okay. So we began to develop, Menger did, um, what we might call a theory of the consumer. Now Menger still hadn't solved the paradox of value yet. Okay. Still hadn't explained why goods that may have a higher use value have a lower exchange value. But he had a brilliant insight. And he asked himself a question. He said, look, let's take someone who has a number of units of a good. So, so he, he began, he focused, the key thing was he focused on individual units of the good. Now, uh, we'll take the fictional character Robinson Crusoe. This is very like the example he gives, though it's not exactly the example he gives. Um, who has, is, is um, shipwrecked on an island. He's stranded there. Um, all he has is his human labor and the natural resources that exist on the island. And he finds that he can grow grain. And he can do, serve many ends with that grain that he can grow. Let's say wheat. Uh, he can um, use it to, to stay alive. He can bake it into bread. Okay, the, the, let's say there's, uh, he has, let's say, five sacks of, 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 of wheat. Okay, so his first end would be to, to bake bread that would keep him alive for the year. The second um, sack would be to bake bread for maintaining health and vitality. Okay, the first sack only gives him enough bread just to keep him alive. But if he wants to move around and, and, and engage in other actions, he has to have um, he has to remain healthy and, and, and be more vital and strong. So he needs more bread to um, to eat. Um, the third sack he'll put aside for next year's harvest so that he can sow the grain and then have a harvest next year and stay alive for another year. Um, the fourth uh, will be for the production of, well, Menger used whiskey, I like vodka, so I'll use vodka. Okay, so it's for, you know, ferment it and make it into vodka, okay, um, so you can have a genteel meal, okay. Um, the fifth is for feeding um, animals yielding uh, meat, dairy, and poultry products. So he finds some animals that he can domesticate, I don't know, goats or whatever you want to, Maybe maybe there's cattle, but uh, so um, which will provide him with meat, and he finds some some sort of chickens on this island, and so um, he can vary his diet. He can have eggs and meat and milk and so on. Okay. Now I've ranked those ends as, as Menger did, did in his book, meaning that the first end is the most important, the second is the second most important. Now notice Menger did not say that the first end gives certain satisfaction, ten utils, and the second end four utils. You don't need to do that. Okay. What Menger did was to say that the first end is more important to this person, the second end is, is the second most important. We as outside observers can never know people's rankings. Okay, we call this a value scale today. We can never know people's value scales. Though I know one part of your value scale. And the part that I know is that of all the alternatives that face you, of all the different uses of your time right now, you prefer to be sitting here, okay, than to be anywhere else. I know somebody get up, get up and walk out to prove me wrong, but in any case, I see Doug about to leave. Uh, in any case, you are making a choice because of scarcity in the real world. Okay, as Guido, um, Dr. Hulsman emphasized last night. Okay, so so you can know a part of a person's value scale, and we know that people have value scales because if the good is scarce, that means they have to make a choice on how to allocate the good, or as Menger used the term, economize on the good, use it for their most important ends. Okay, so here's the question. He has five sacks. Oh, he has many ends for this, okay? Good, but he only has five sacks. Okay, if he had a six sack, he would, he would use it for food for a parrot so he could have some company to drink vodka and talk, talk with him when he's, uh, eating dinner and so on. Um, okay. The question Menger asked, which really unraveled the whole paradox of value and solved it, was, what is the value of each sack of wheat? Is the value of the sack used for the first end higher than the value of the sack used for the fourth end? Are they all equal in value? 
And if they are all equal in value, they're absolutely interchangeable. I can use, I can use the, the sack earmark for the fourth to, 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 to produce bread, and I can use the sack earmark for the first to, um, to ferment into whiskey. Okay? So they're interchangeable. So why should the values be different? But if they're not different, then what are they equal to? And here's where Menger came up with his law of marginal utility, which he didn't name, as I said. It was a later um, economist that did that. Okay. Does anyone want to take a crack at what, what question that Menger asked? Very simple question. Yes. Right. If one of those five sacks are lost, okay, and this man here got it, if there is a pack of, of rodents that, that get into the barn where he stored the sacks or into, into the enclosure where he stored the sacks, and eats, let's say, the second sack. They eat through the second sack. The other four are fine. Okay? Does he go without the second end? Of course not. What does he do? He reallocates his resources. He economizes so that the end he gives up with the reduced supply is which end? The fifth. Okay? The lowest ranked end that can be served by the existing supply of the good. We call that utility. The satisfaction from an end is the utility. Marginal means the relevant, in Austrian economics, it means the, the relevant utility. What's the relevant utility? Menger calls the dependent utility. What utility depends on the loss of one sack, of one concrete unit of that good? Well, having meat and, and milk and um, eggs over the course of the year. According to him, that's the least valuable end. What is the value of each one of those sacks then when he has a supply of five? It's simply the marginal utility. It establishes the value. All five of those sacks are equal to the value that he derives, the satisfaction he derives from the fifth end. Because if any one of them were lost, that's the end he would give up. Okay? Now, once he's lost that, he only has four sacks left. Okay? And here we see the law of marginal utility um, forming. What happens to the value of each unit of that good? Does it go up or down? Goes up. So the law is, the greater the supply of a good that an individual possesses, the lower the what? The value of any of the units. If he found another sack, if he found that he could harvest another sack, then the margin utility would fall from the satisfaction from the fifth end to the satisfaction from the sixth end. Then if he lost one, he would, he would give up the satisfaction that he derives from having this, this weird parrot with him. Okay. Um, so here, here we see that the scarcer a good is, the higher its value is. And that is the law of marginal utility. How does that solve the paradox of value? Very simply. Why is a pound of bread less valuable than, let's say, a, uh, a pound of diamonds? Because even though bread may satisfy, or, or let's make it even more extreme, uh, sometimes it's called the water diamond paradox. Why is a gallon of water more important than, let's say, the, uh, the I think it was 11 carat diamond that Kobe Bryant bought to his wa- for his wife. It was a purple diamond. I think he paid $16 million for it or something um, to atone for his marital infidelity a few years ago. Um, okay, so you have that diamond in your pocket and you're in a desert and um, you haven't had water for three days and that's about the length of time people can go without water before their, their organs begin to, to shut down. Um, would you give that diamond up for a gallon of water? Of course you would. Why? Because the, the marginal utility of water is higher than the marginal utility of the diamond. Because the end that can be served for that, by that one gallon of water, which is to keep you alive for another three days, is higher than the end that can be served by that, 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 that diamond. Okay? On the other hand, in a normal situation, a gallon of water, would you, you know, a gallon of water is a few cents if you, if you if it drips out of your, your your faucet you know you lose a few cents worth of 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 of, of ends that you could achieve okay so so the law of marginal utility explains completely the diamond water paradox um, and or, or take a, an, another example I give my undergraduates um, let's say a family has three automobiles and um, one is used by let's say the primary breadwinner uh, in the family uh, let's say they're pretty interchangeable the automobiles. The other is used um, by, let's say, the spouse who has a part-time job. Uh, and the third is used by Junior. Now, let's say the old man cracks up to his car. Okay. Not DUI, but just maybe careless driving. So he cracks up the car. Does he go without the car? 
No, Junior does. Because the mortgage utility of the car to Junior is the lowest, given that, 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 you know, the family makes, ranks the values, the primary breadwinner, which is, you know, brings in, in, in most of the, of, of the income, okay, having the highest value. Now let me give you a little puzzle, just to see if you understand this, and that's below here. Okay, here's a, far, here's a farmer with two different goods, okay? He's got three horses and two cows, okay? Most important ends is to use the first horse for plowing his field, the second horse to attach that to the same team to plow the field. It makes it much easier for him and he's more productive. Um, the third cow, or the first cow serves the first end, for, uh, serves the third end, which is to have milk. And then the second cow provides cheese and butter, and that's lower rank, that's the fourth end. And then the, the, the third horse, remember he has three horses, two cows, uh, is used for pleasure riding. Okay. The barn is burning. You can only save four animals. You want to save the most valuable animals. Okay. Which animal do you leave in the barn? Which animal has the lower value, the cow or the horse? Yeah, the horse has the lower value. Okay. Even though it serves the highest end, okay, we don't look at the highest end to determine value, but we look at the lowest end. You would lose the least satisfaction if you allowed that third horse to stay in, in, in the barn. Once that happens, though, which animal is more, more valuable, the cow or the horse? Now the horse becomes more valuable. But with these five and these ends as they are, okay, the more valuable animal, even though the horse serves the first two ends, the more valuable animal is the cow. Because its marginal utility is higher. It's the satisfaction from the fourth ranked end. Okay? All right, but, but Menger didn't stop here. Uh, so he explained the value of, 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 of consumer goods according to the law of market utility, and he explained how these values can change as scarcities change, and he, and, and, and he showed that in, in a normal situation, diamonds would have a higher value to people, but in, in certain extreme situations, water would have a higher value than, than diamonds. Okay, it has nothing to do with the cost of production. It has to do with the concrete units of the good and the concrete wants. Okay, but now Menger wanted to explain why is it that if cost of production doesn't determine the price of the product, but it's really the other way around, as we'll see, price of the product determines the cost of production, why is it that, or, or how can we explain the value of the ovens that bake the bread and, and, and the, the, the workers that um, are, are combined with the ovens to bake the bread and the wheat that on its own in the field is not valuable to us at all because we can't eat it. Why would these things have um, value? Well, he came up with something called a theory of imputation. And what he showed was that the classical school assumed, uh, let, me, let me just uh, give, give us some ter terminology. Menger distinguished between higher order and lower order goods. Higher order goods are goods that are further away from the consumer. Okay, They're further away from the final consumer's good. The final good was a consumer good. Okay, So at the bottom... We have human wants here. I didn't write it in. Human wants for bread, okay, that's the final stage when humans, uh, consumers buy the bread at the retail stage. Production goes from higher order goods to lower order goods. That's true. The classical school is right. You have to have the wheat first, then you have to get factors of production um, to mill the wheat into a flour. So you need workers, you need um, a, a, a mill, to grind, grind the wheat into flowers and so on, into flour. Then you need to take the flour and, and combine it with bakers and ovens, okay, in the third stage there, to get bread. And then you have to, dis the bread is distributed to the retail um, area and you get the final good, retail sector and you get the final good. Okay, so production goes from the higher order to lower order goods. But according to Menger, value doesn't go that way. Okay, why why should wheat be valuable? Okay. Wheat's only valuable because of causation. In other words, the final bread itself is not valuable. It's the consumption of the bread, the service of the bread in satisfying the wants for uh, nourishment. Okay, so value goes up. It goes from consumer demand to have satisfied their hunger up to the bread. Okay. Uh, so the bread, because the bread causes the satisfaction of the demand, it has value. Be and because the flour and the ovens cause the production of the bread, they have value. So their value is derived. Okay, well, let's put it another way. The value is imputed upward. It's imputed from consumer wants 
to the retail goods, to the higher stage goods that cooperate in the production of the final retail good. The only reason why wheat has any value whatsoever is because wheat and uh, when, when, when it's combined with workers and a mill and so on, can cause the production of value. Okay, so the objective causality goes from the wheat down through the bread, but the, va- the causality of value goes from consumer wants all the way up to the wheat. And let me give you an example of this very quickly. Um, yeah, let's say that the um, war on drugs, which we know is, 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 is fails because it's attacking the supply side. Let's say suddenly people's values in the U.S. change radically. And they became uh, aesthetic. That is, they, they, they stopped drinking, they stopped taking drugs. Okay. What would happen to all those poppy fields in Afghanistan and Colombia and so on? Would they have any value any longer? Would gorillas be fighting over them with the government? What would happen to the, um, the distributors, to the, let's say the, the, the drug cartels? They would just fall apart. Okay. Why? Because it's demand that gives value to the good. And it's the value of the good that is then imputed back to the means of producing that good. Let's take another example, um, which I I give to my undergraduates. Well, I used to give, because they probably haven't seen this movie. But uh, there was a great movie with Harrison Ford called Witness. It takes place in the Amish um, country um, in southeastern Pennsylvania. The Amish are a group of people, also a religion. They share a religion in which um, any sort of ostentation is, is frowned upon. So they wear black clothing, and they don't wear any ornamentation whatsoever. Uh, they don't even have buttons on their clothing. They have, like, sort of hooks. Okay, so they avoid any sort of ornamentation. Okay, let's say all Americans adopt this sort of code of values. What happens to the value of a diamond? Forgetting about its industrial uses. Gem-quality diamonds. They drop to zero. What happens to the, the, the high wages of, of a highly skilled jeweler? They now drop. Okay, and what happens to the value of diamond mines and stocks in diamond mines? They drop to let's say zero, assuming everyone adopts these values. Okay, so it's not the fact that it costs a lot to produce diamonds that makes them expensive. Rather, people are willing to pay high prices for diamonds, and because they're willing to pay high prices for diamonds, because because of the high margin utility to them of diamonds. Um, other people, the producers, are willing to undertake or use a lot of resources to 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 to, um, to produce those diamonds. There, uh, there was an economist, a French philosopher and economist, Condillac, who wrote in 1776, the same year as Adam Smith, and he had a much better value theory than Adam Smith. But but he said, um, oysters are not um, pearls are not expensive because men have to dive to very uh, deep uh, depths to get them. But rather, men dive very deeply to get oysters and are willing to undertake the risk and, and, and the cost of diving because diamonds or oyster, uh, pearls, pearls have a very high price. Okay, so it's consumers' goods that um, bring about um, ultimately, and actually not consumers' goods, but consumer wants that ultimately bring about the prices not only of consumer goods, determine not only the value and prices of consumer goods, but determine the value of all the producers' goods. So cost doesn't determine price. Price determines cost. Okay, that's Menger's point. Uh, the last thing I want to say about Menger very quickly is, okay, so he explained why um, ovens and and mills and 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 labor, bakers and so on, labor, why they why they they have such a high price, or why they have the price that they do. That's called the fear of imputation. But he wanted to go further. He wanted to explain what is the value of one laborer in producing a good, or one oven, or one, one, one um, uh, mill wheel that you find in a mill. Okay. Well, let me give you an example. He again asked a very um, pregnant question, a question that was full of implications. Let's take a very simple example to, and, and to illustrate this question. Okay, let's say you can produce a thousand bushels of wheat, W's for wheat, by using 90 days of labor, two horses, one plow, um, 40 acres of land and 500 pounds of, of fertilizer. Okay, and, and the fertilizer comes in 100 pound bags. Okay. And what is the, and let's say we ask the question, what's the value of one 
hundred one 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 hundred pound bag of fertilizer. Okay, what is the value of that? How can we separate that from all the goods that were combined? We know that the all those goods together have the same value as what the thousand bushels of wheat because they all cooperate to produce a thousand bushels of wheat. So if the thousand bushels of wheat sell for five thousand dollars, then all of forgetting about the profit for the entrepreneur, then all of those goods in total have a value of five thousand dollars. But what's the value of each? Well, how, how do we disentangle that? Okay. Well, what Menger said was assume the following. Let's say we had got rid of one 100 pound sack of, of fertilizer. So now we, we combine all of those things together. But now right here, instead of having 500 pounds of fertilizer, we only have 400 pounds. What is the difference in the total product? By how much, how much wheat will we lose? What will be the reduction in the total amount of wheat produced? And so let's just take a simple example. Let's say that, in fact, if you subtract 100 pounds of fertilizer from that production function, it's called, okay, and you find that the amount of wheat declines by 40, um, 40 bushels, well then, what he called the marginal, well, he didn't call it, it was, again, it was a name given later, the marginal product of the 100 pounds of fertilizer is 40 bushels of wheat. So the value of a specific unit of, of this good, a sack of, of, of fertilizer, is the value that is attached to what is lost if you subtract that from production. Okay. Now, Menger didn't go any further than that. He just said, well, the farmer loses the utility of 40 bushels of wheat that are not produced when he doesn't use that extra 100 pounds of fertilizer, and therefore that's the value of the 100 pounds of fertilizer. Um, others have gone further, and I'll end with this. Um, if there's a price... Uh, let's say the price of fertilizer is five, uh, price of wheat is five dollars a sack, um, or five dollars a bushel, and you lose forty bushels when you subtract a hundred pounds of wheat, then what's the monetary value of, of that hundred pounds of fertilizer? It's the amount of wheat you lost from not using it, which is forty bushels, times the price of each bushel five dollars, or two hundred dollars. It's the amount of revenue that is lost by the farmer. Okay? because he has less product to produce. So Menger resolved that problem too. Not only did he show that, 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 that prices determine costs, he showed exactly the method. I mean, he didn't develop it as, as far as I have here. The, the method by which we isolate the value of any particular producer's good, capital good, piece of land, labor, in, in production. And I'll stop there. Thank you.